The African National Congress, a once proud symbol of African liberation, has been gutted from within and handed over to the very forces that it once opposed. The ultimate insult to its legacy, a collision with the Democratic Alliance, a political party often associated with the enduring legacy of colonialism and racial privilege. The ANC we see today is no longer the party of liberation. It has become a mere shadow, a ghost of what it once stood for, betrayed by those who claimed to lead it. However, this betrayal did not occur overnight. It has been in the making for many decades, planned and executed with a cold and calculated precision. To understand how the ANC arrived at this point, we must look back to the 1970s. At that time, the white business elite in South Africa realized that apartheid in its most explicit and brutal form was becoming unsustainable. But instead of genuinely repenting or seeking true justice, they simply restructured their strategy. This is where the story of the Urban Foundation begins. The Urban Foundation's role in sustaining white power. In December 1976, the memory of the nationwide student uprising earlier that year was still fresh in the air. The uprising led by Belak youth demanding freedom shook the white establishments. Among those most concerned were prominent figures like Harry Oppenheimer, head of Anglo-American, Clive Minnell from the anglo -Val, and Anton Rupert representing the Afrikaner capital. These men saw the tides of the change coming but had no intention of relinquishing their grip on power, so they devised a new approach. The Urban Foundation was created under the geese of being a think tank for urban development and social reform, but its true purpose was far more sinister. It was a tactical move to protect white monopoly capital's interests for the future. The real goal of the Urban Foundation was not to uplift the black majority, but to ensure that the economic power remained in white hands, even as political power slowly shifted. The strategy was not unlike the CIA's approach to covert operations across Africa, the Middle East, and South America. The CIA often masked political interference and regime change with the rhetoric of promoting democracy, human rights, and free speech. The Urban Foundation did the same, using a facade of development to hide a true goal of maintaining white economic dominance. The Foundation's real mission was to groom a new cadre of black leaders who would be willing to cooperate with white business interests. These leaders were not chosen for their revolutionary credentials or dedication to the liberation struggle. Instead, they were selected based on their willingness to compromise and collaborate with white elites. Among the first to be groomed were Cyril Ramaphosa and Kweta Mantashe, two figures who would later rise to prominent positions within the ANC and be instrumental in its betrayal from within. Ramaphosa's journey began when he was in his early 20s. He was appointed to the Urban Foundation Board, where he worked alongside influential white businessmen like Clive Manel. His inclusion in these circles was no accident. It was part of a broader strategy to groom him as an intermediary between the white business elites and the black majority. Similarly, Mandash's political career began not with the armed struggle, but within the mining sector. He co-founded the National Union of Mine Workers with Ramaphosa, and both men soon became trusted insiders for white business interests. Over time, they were strategically placed in positions of power within the ANC, ensuring that any future democratic transition will be tightly controlled to protect white economic interests. Under the leadership of Ramaphosa and Mandashe, the ANC slowly fractured. Factionalism took root and the party began to break apart. As this happened, several breakaway movements formed, including the United Democratic Movement, Congress of the People, Economic Freedom Fighters, and the more recent MK party. These breakaways were the result of growing disillusionment within the ANC's ranks, and as many realized that the party's leadership had abandoned its core principles. The final straw came with the Marikana massacre in 2012, where 34 striking mine workers were killed by police. This event demonstrated just how far the ANC had drifted from its revolutionary roots. Ramaphosa with Guatemantashe silent backing played a key role in the tragedy. His ties to Lon Min, the mining company involved, and his pressure on the police to act against the workers revealed the depth of the betrayal. Despite their claims to uphold the ANC's step-aside rule, which mandates that any implicated member step down, both Ramaphosa and Mandashi have been embroiled in scandals. 
Ramaphosa touted as Mr. Clean by white-owned media has faced allegations of corruption linked to Busasa. While Mandasha was involved in a scandal involving upgrades to his properties also funded by Busasa. As if this weren't enough, Ramaphosa was recently implicated in a scandal involving millions of undeclared US dollars found on his private game reserve. Despite their roles in these scandals, both leaders have refused to apply the step aside rule to themselves, highlighting the hypocrisy at the heart of the ANC's leadership. In conclusion, the ANC's collision with the DA is the culmination of decades of betrayal. The party has become a hollow shell, no longer representing the interests of the African majority, but instead serving the same white elites it once fought against. Now more than ever, it is time for the people of South Africa to forge a new path, one that rejects this false dichotomy and seeks true liberation for all.